Uh, what a joy, again, to be here. And, uh, you know, this is a unique age. Uh, Aaron, baby, where are you? There you are. Man, that was... Even you were splitting arrows at 16. How old were you when you first got up here and began to launch like that? 17. 17. And even then, buddy, the anointing was on you, and you... Whoosh, and you just uh, discerned the moment and landed the plane from worship, got us focused in a clear direction, and you're still doing that. So thank you. What a joy to have you guys in tandem together. Uh, the right brothers, you're the both right people here at this moment. Uh, and so it is an honor um, to be able to come back. Um, I kept going back and forth. Is it 26 years? I was doing the math. Is it 25 or 26? I had a little dyslexic moment there. Uh, it is 26. Someone who knows how to do math did that. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, today, in, in the history of The Rock, obviously I've done a number of anniversary messages, and they were in different times. They were in placid times when there was lily pods and ponds and little swans floating on the lake. Uh, well, this is a different age, and um, I do remember seasons where you could almost imagine what was ahead and begin to, in some way, plan for that sequentially. Well, that is gone. All those little um, uh, somewhat predictable, seasonal things that go on in some kind of a loop in terms of churches is really different. It's different now. Um, we could describe a lot of things that have done that. Let's just say God did that. And he wanted to reboot the church in a significant way and really cause the church to come to a new level. It's very hard at times to read the Bible. How many of you still read the Bible? That's good. It's hard to read the Bible and oftentimes going, now is that exactly, what, are we doing what the early disciples, is that? So that's hard because it challenges me. I want to be like those men and women. Um, and that's why I signed up. That's why I joined, because I saw something fresh and wonderful uh, in the, the, the abandoned lives of Jesus Christ. Um, I was telling Susie, Jim Durkin had an old message that he preached, and he would say at one point, you know, the groovy Jesus trip never did exist, you know, and he's preaching that in 1972, that the groovy Jesus trip never did exist. That little illusion that, uh, coloring by the numbers, everything is just going exactly as planned. The unpredictable God is just going to color uh, uh, in a way that we anticipate. And God goes, you know what? I'm not tame. You're not going to domesticate me. Uh, I'm going to break out. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And that's really what's happening now. And I would say it's a good gauge for all of us at the time when all of a sudden, boy, I didn't expect that. Boy, I didn't see that coming. All those moments will determine what you're trusting in and what you're relying on. Are you trusting in God? or in some kind of a little expectation sequence you have rolled out for where you think things are going. Uh, when God says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts and my ways aren't your ways, it gives you a hint <laughs> that whatever you're thinking is not it. And so better to learn to flow uh, than to in some way imagine you know uh, what should be taking place. And so uh, I'm gonna pray and, um, and believe God that today there'll be an impartation. Father, I thank you for this church family. Thank you for you are the God of all seasons, Lord. You've never duplicated a molecule or a moment or a memory. Everything is brand spanking new uh, because that's who you are. And uh, you certainly don't want your kids to do that. You certainly don't want us, Lord, to live on the old and uh, say, God, do it again. That's an insult. Say, God, do it again. We don't want you to do anything again. We want you to do something fresh, Lord. Do something fresh in us. The creator of the universe, do something fresh and prepare your church for the freshness of this moment in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I, I could say buckle your seatbelts because it, uh, I believe this next season is going to be that. It's going to be one of those where uh, you're going to have to kind of relinquish hold your grip on where you want things to go. Um, and what that should do is give you a greater confidence in God and trusting in him. That's what's supposed to happen. I'm gonna trust more in God, less in me. John the Baptist didn't say, I must decrease, that he must increase. He didn't say that. He said, he must increase, that I may decrease. In other words, you let God get bigger, you'll get smaller. Don't try and get smaller. Just let God get bigger, and all of a sudden, you'll depreciate. So uh, Brian and I have a couple of uh, books that we were... Uh, where's my family? Where's my family up there? 
and uh, beautiful wife Susie. It's hard to tell which is Susie. She's the woman on the right, um, uh, not far right, but second right. And Deborah and Havila, they're magnificent husbands who I love and respect. Seven. Uh, Wesley, is it today? Sweetheart, he turns 13 today? Wesley. Tuesday. He had a wild party last night with his friends. We went there, a uh, slumber party. We didn't stay for that, but uh, he's 13. I'm holding him. And uh, seven, we, pretty soon we'll have all seven grandkids in the teens. Oh my gosh. But it's going to be exciting. And uh, that's my fam. I love them. Uh, Brian and I have uh, written a couple books. Brian wrote one more recently. And last time I was here, we gave it away. Uh, and we're doing the same today. So it's on Zoomers. Um, which is the right there, Uh, Generation Z, which many of us need to continue to discern what's going on in the next generation. We need people who are meteorologists, who are standing offshore saying, well, this is coming, and it looks like this, that you can be ready for what's happening, how to relate to them. Uh, God, again, um, is doing something wondrous uh, and magnificent. Uh, We were not a promising generation. I was part of, you know, the boomers, uh, who were uh, out of World War II, very straight and narrow parents, you know, fought the war. And then we rejected a lot of the structural materialism, uh, just going through the motions. We wanted something fresh, looking for more freedom. And unfortunately, without God, that got us off into more bondage. Uh, and yet no one at that point was thinking, man, it's awesome. Half a million kids naked and doing drugs at Woodstock. Man, it's just looking promising. No one was thinking that. It was a tumultuous time. People were going, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And so you may look at the world now and go, you know, man, what is going to happen? What are my kids? And, you know, we had that discussion, having kids. We want kids in this world. Even getting married was a big discussion. Should we get married? The world's nuts. Should we get married? Um, and we did, obviously, and have kids and now grandkids. And yet God is still the God of the future. And so Brian has the book on the right. Mine on the left, I wrote in 2008, published in 2009. And Bob and LaDonna, thank you again for being here as well. You guys, you're still able. You still got it, Bob. You still got it. I love you both very much. I keep remembering to thank people and then I... Don't, but thank you for that. Uh, 2009, I wrote that about 2029. And uh, I really do believe that is a, a book for this age right now. There's still things that are in place that will be happening. Both of us are offering these books for free. And the next slide, we'll talk about a little caution. Uh, there is an explosive device in these spines. And uh, we put that there because we're asking people to be honest. If you buy it, if you get it rather for free, and you don't touch it, it will explode. And we lost some people recently. It was just so, I heard that report and it's just like, gosh, I miss those people. So if you get it, read it. Otherwise, it's on you. All right, discerning the hour, reality's last stand. Uh, That is the message today. Um, There's always been an assault against reality. In the garden, the devil said, "Hath God said, And he began to try and distort reality, change things. And that's always been happening. And so all of, and I, again, that was our counterculture reality. Um, I I was happy to be called before I met Jesus, a freak. That was the term that we used for counterculture people, a freak. Now, again, that's not a very flattering term. And then Jesus freak was a rather easy segue from freak. But uh, the the culture uh, can do freakish things and all of a sudden, uh, they're creating a new reality. And that's really what's happening now. And yet the Bible says in Amos, for the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. I'm not a prophet. I do have a gift of prophecy. But uh, there are prophetic folks that are discerning this moment. Uh, I do feel I have a sense and a grace for that. We should not be the last people to figure out. We shouldn't be back in the feathers wondering what's going on. We should be crawling toward the tip of the arrow to say, God, what's happening? And again, Aaron, what you said, boom, shakalaka. That was awesome. (laughs) You nailed it just perfectly. You did a Perfect landing as well. So in 1989, I wrote a book on the church of the future, traveled, did a tour with that called We've Got a Future, uh, 21st Century Church. And um, then in 2009, as I said, I wrote a book called 2029. And then Brian and I, 
come on, Brian, we're gonna write a book together. I've written a couple of books with different people, but this is the third one on, and the, the working title uh, for this is Reality's Last Stand. Next picture, there it is, Reality's Last Stand. It may change, the picture may change, but it gives you an idea that we're going into some unknown territory where the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to brainwash a generation to believe lies, form their own reality, and then be able to attack anyone who attacks their reality. That their reality is it, either you buy into that or you are persona non grata, and I believe that's gonna escalate. And that happens in most totalitarian countries, that they have a reality, if you don't buy into it, then you go to jail or whatever. And that's coming, that's coming. And we've been talking about that actually over the years. Uh, in 1989, I wrote this, in uh, 2029, the church tends to drive with its emergency break on. Propagators of the status quo have left their skid marks down through the centuries, even when King James ordered his famous translation of the Bible, most of those present were opposed. They didn't want the laity to get what the clergy had. Religion was entrenched. They didn't want people to have their own relationship with God. Let someone else tell you how to follow God. As we compete with the shrewd sons of the world for the hearts of men and women, we need a new generation of leaders mature enough to rightly divide between the eternal and the temporal. And that's always been the challenge. The church tend to canonize, uh, canonize uh, moments. I remember seeing songs in the very early innings. We're just saved, singing songs. And then a year later, that song, I wouldn't sing that right now. That song had kind of lost some of its impact. It was, we were trying to redig the well on something that was not quite exactly what God wanted us to do at that moment. So differentiating between the eternal and the temporal, the foundational and the cultural, the future belonged to those who can. And then the next book, 2029, uh, we talk about, uh, and, and this, again, this is written 15 years ago but it's ha happening now as experimentation, and it's only one portion of the book, but it gives you an idea of it. With sophisticated, lifelike robots takes place, human to robot soul ties will be established. This will eventually lead to the wholesale acceptance of human to robot relationships in every dimension. I'm convinced that unless there's this revival in the Western world, human to robot interaction of all levels will become completely acceptable within our lifetime. And you're a bigot if you don't accept it. And, and if you, you're a hater, if you're not willing to accept that I have a little robot in my house and that's my relationship. It's very special. Okay, this is a staggering thought, yielding civilization, destroying implications, yet barring divine intervention, I believe will take place. So that's that. And then 2025, a little thought, this may not be in the book, but I'm just sharing it. In the years to come, attachment to alternate realities will become so pervasive that those who criticize this addiction to the unreal will be ostracized from society and labeled ignorant haters and bigots. The rejects, this rejection of the fundamental order of God's creation is what Satan intended from the beginning. He said, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God yourself. You can form your own reality. If you're a God, you can form your own reality, knowing good and evil. Um, you know, in 18 something, uh, there was the original Bible, uh, not Bible, dictionary rather, that had a definition of discernment. And it's discerning not just good and evil, but truth and lies, uh, right and wrong. And, and then they eliminated that there really is no absolute truth. So it's what we determine is right, what we determine is wrong. And so that, that is what will trend in the days ahead. Um, I, I do believe, I, I had a visual today. It's kind of like if you've seen movies where you've got an astronaut on space, he's floating in space, and he's tethered, then all of a sudden he decides to be untethered. And then at that point, they, they go out into, and that's really what's happening now. They're untethering from reality, untethering from the biblical reality, which is the only reality. And consequently, they're gonna face those consequences. But the Bible says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We should be aware of what's happening and prepare for that. 
Uh, the way, candidly, because I tend to be pretty intense emotionally, was suicidal for six months of my life early on, um, processed things, had a lot of ups and downs in my early Christian life. I didn't like the highs or the lows. They both were an illusion. So I began to modify things in my heart until I came to the place where I wanted to in advance anticipate where things might go so that in a sense I could look at worst case scenarios and then stare them down and go, Okay, okay. And then face each one of them until whatever happened, I wouldn't be blindsided. Because I got blindsided and I didn't like that. So if we're looking ahead, if we are a prophetic people, if we're discerning people, if we can look ahead, then we need to be aware of what's happening and the consequence and the effect on it. Not to be afraid. You know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I read the back of the book, God wins. So it's not a question of feeling like somehow, you know, God, God's out of control. No, God is doing great. He's never done better. And a big sign in heaven says everything is going exactly as planned. But for those of us on earth, it's a knuckle ride. It's a ride where we're going, whoa, this is different than I was anticipating. And so the supernatural, we are supernatural beings. You can see that from the movies that we make. Uh, there are various options. All of these have supernatural overtones. Uh, and that's why of the 50 most popular films of all time, 90% have fantasy, supernatural, or otherworldly themes. We want to be supernatural. We want to be able to walk in the spirit realm. We are spirit beings, eternal spirit beings, having a very temporal, temporary natural experience. And this is the dress rehearsal. It's the shortest season of our everlasting life, the dress rehearsal for eternity. So what happens now is going to really set in motion in some kind of way an eternal stewardship you and I are given. Work is not part of the curse. Work is not a curse. We'll be working. We'll be laboring for God. We're not going to be sitting on clouds and sipping, you know, pina coladas with cherubs floating around with snack trays, okay? We are going to be there uh, ready for our next assignment. And so the faith, the faith muscles you build right now, staring down things that don't exist, but you're, that don't yet exist, staring down the future, if you will, with faith and confidence and trust in God, those muscles you will take with you into eternity. So the idea, I'm just trying to get off the planet, man. I'm just trying to cruise. I'm just hoping I can hang on. Stop. Stop. Get a grip on your life. You're a spiritual being. You're a man of God. You're a woman of God. Get a backbone. Come on. Get conviction. I believe that. The future of heaven and earth is certain. God wins, the devil loses, and mankind is divided. That, that, that's going to happen. We have to decide now whether we believe that and whether or not we're going to put all our chips, be all in, pushing our chips to the middle and going, you know what? I'm with God. I'm going to trust him. I don't care what happens. Really, it's training my soul. For me, I've trained my soul. I don't care what happens. I really don't. What I care about is where I am when it happens. What is my response to what happens? Am I trusting God as it happens? Those are the things I care about. Everything else is semantics. What happens? I mean, I've had left hooks from heaven and hell, and they don't feel that different. <laughs> I don't know, it's God, whatever, you know, I would have come to you sooner, but Satan hindered me. Okay, well, that happens. Things happen in life, and you don't know, man, what is the, is that, but it's God ultimately working. You know, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. Well, yeah, it was God allowing it, Satan requested it, you know, and boom. We have a script that I believe is the perfect script for every one of us, and yet we're going to have to embrace it and see it from God's perspective. Of the 50 highest grossest films of all time, 48 of 50 have supernatural, otherworldly themes. We didn't choose to be supernatural, but we are each supernatural beings. The great tendency we have is, I don't want to be supernatural. It requires too much. I don't want to really have to walk in faith. I want to know what's going on. It makes me feel better. That's a soul that needs to be trained. You don't train your children just to accept what's happening. You prepare them for what is going to happen. You prepare them for new things that are coming their way, that they cannot be overwhelmed by the unexpected, but they can flow with it because you've trained their soul to accept the future, whatever that may be. 
Uh, the battle in the eternal supernatural realm is more real than the temporary trials of earth. This is, it's important to see with eternal eyes. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not human, human agencies. There's things behind the curtain. There's things that we don't see that we have. And the only way I can get in touch really for me with the supernatural realm in terms of washing my brain is with the word of God, the eternal word of God. I wash my heart and mind with the word of God every day. And that renews my mind. I don't think you can be a supernatural person without washing your mind with the word of God. You're gonna to tend to be more carnal, natural, looking at trying to figure out what's here. Don't worry, be happy. You're gonna try and figure out how to solve the riddle yourself. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly realms. Again, none of us read that and go, man, that's awesome. I love that that it's way beyond us. No, it all stretches us. That, when I first read that as a young Christian, I went, whoa, man. I had experienced the dark side. I barely made it. I could have been picked off at any moment by the enemy. I got delivered from demons when I received the Lord. The necklaces were choking me. I could breathe. So I understand there was a demonic battle going on, but all of a sudden now I'm in it. And I need to have faith to believe for what God wants to do. Um, therefore, put on the full armor of God, Sword of the Spirit, helmet of salvation, shield of faith. You know, we need to stand in the middle of this battle right now. Again, this is the challenge. I, have, I, have, I may have intimated this the last time I spoke here, uh, but I've been working with some folks uh, that I know, uh, that I've known for many years, who are in trouble in various ways. And honestly, they didn't prepare. I love them. And, and I'm not saying, I'm not playing taps over their lives. I'm just saying they were blindsided by unpreparedness and they knew better. And they understand they knew better. They did not prepare. They got into just a little religious thing or I'm doing my own, you know, relationship with God. I don't need people, church, whatever. And all of a sudden they are drowning and now they're trying to be rescued. So my appeal to you, it's gonna get more challenging. Decide today that you want a relationship with God that is real. Religion can't help you. Just going through the motions is not gonna help you. You need a relationship with God yourself and you're fully capable of doing that. You are fully capable of having your own relationship with God. That's why he made you, he created you for that purpose. So uh, I could not, I went to bed last night and just kind of marinating on this and soaking on this and just honestly, I was very emotional in bed. Susie hadn't come to bed yet. I was just kind of worshiping. And um, I just was reflecting on Ezekiel 33. That, uh, that uh, you know, if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not warn the people of the land, that the watchman suffers the consequence. And the watchman for me at this point is, guys, the season has changed. I mean, if I wondered if it was changing, I've already prepared this message for many months and I've been germinating this for years. But all of a sudden, Israel, I mean, if that does not get your attention, guys, this is a, this is a complete change. This is a, a half a century altering event happened yesterday. Yeah. That is meant, in case any of us were wondering, well, you know, everything will continue as it always has. No, it's not. It's not going to. But good. You know, even the very part of me, listen carefully, the part of me that gets concerned about that is not my friend. That's a little guy of, you know, maybe anxiety, fear, doubt, unbelief. Little guy I've palled around with. He gives me some comfort. I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> He's not my friend. That's my enemy. I don't care if it's generational. I don't care if you've always been that way. Stop it. And I, I believe it's within our power to say no to it. Never forget, we're in a spiritual battle for our inheritance. Right. You know, there, there's an inheritance God wants to give us of being sons and daughters of the living God. Right. That's a big deal. And again, this is a moment in time, our planet Earth experience, a moment in time, but it's the dress rehearsal for eternity. You say, are you trying to put the fear of God in me? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the beginning of wisdom. I mean, you have no idea what's going on if you don't fear God. 
It's the foundation of understanding what's going on. We're just these little toads here. And without God, we have no future. God is the one who created us for him. And our little idea of what we want to do with our lives is a waste of time. And that comes from Satan. Never forget, we are in a spiritual battle for our inheritance. The giants we need to conquer are spiritual, mental, and emotional strongholds. Again, we make, I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. We each make friends with emotional enemies. Enemies like fear, lust, anger, pride, anxiety, depression. We each make friends with emotional enemies uh, that are evil companions. And here they are. They're, they're the giants in the land. The Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Parasites, Hittites, Jebusites, Adasites, Backbites, all the ites. <laughs> These are our enemies. Now, they may look like, you know, complicated little words here. Well, there's, there's a meaning to all those names. Those little giants in your promised land. When you come out of bondage, come out of Egypt, come out of slavery and come to Jesus and are baptized in water as you cross the Red Sea, the journey to the promised land was only 11 days. It's an 11-day journey if you just go right there, or it's a 40-day trek going, following your own will, rebelling, not willing to accept what God is doing. Then you can turn that into a 40-year marathon. But ultimately, you've got to go into the promised land, and you've got to face every one of those giants, and they are these. Here are their names. Hittites means confusion, fear, self-pity, discouragement. This is the actual definition of those names of those tribes. So you, when you deal with fear and self-pity and discouragement and confusion, you are actually fighting giants, giants that may have had hold on you. How many of you, let, let's be candid, how many of you are more spiritually healthy than your parents? Just stand for a second. You are more spiritually healthy than your parents. This is a breakthrough, guys. Maybe seated. Thank you. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm trying to say this. We've come from something, and we are going to something. How many of you don't want your kids to be healthier than you are? We're going to take you in the back. <laughs> we all want our kids to be healthier than we are. When my daughters looked at me and they said 20 years ago, Dad, your ceiling is our floor. I accept that, and it certainly is. I'm looking up, I love looking up at their floor. Okay, that's the first one. Gurgashites, which is old sinful nature. And I'm gonna watch here because my thing's a little hard. Amorites, condemnation. Think about which you battle with. Canaanites, failure. Parasites, pride, anger, lack of discipline. Hivites, Sexual temptation, Jebusites, impurity, addictions. I think, you know, that pretty much covers it. <laughs> For all the friends we have made with certain false comforts on this earth that we've palled around with thinking, I kind of need this. Didn't realize it until they were killing you. Right. And then you realize, I need to kill this. I need to get this thing out of my life. I don't need that. I, and that's why the Bible says in the next verse there, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are about to enter and occupy, he will clear away many of the nations ahead of you. And it mentions them. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. And then it says, when the Lord your God uh, hands these nations over to you, you must completely destroy them. Make no treaties with them. Show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters, for they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. So how, do we, how should we view evil? This is a very important, humorous, somewhat tricky little metaphor, but I believe it's worth it. So how should you view evil and deal with it? If you remove evil in your life, don't imagine you are barbecuing your dog. How many of you 
would like to barbecue your dog. Isn't that disgusting? It's horrible. Susie, don't do that. <laughs> so we, we have an enemy that we have viewed as kind of like, as like that's, that's just my little doggy, little puppy. When you should view it as a chicken. And they're made to be barbecued. <laughs> Let's be candid. How many of you have had chicken recently? It's disgusting. I can't believe you do that to <laughs> those poor little creatures. A dog, if I, I'm not even going to ask you if you ate your dog recently. That's not, <laughs> I know it's the last days, but that really is wrong. We've got to look at the things that are trying to kill us and kill those we love with that kind of conviction. It's right for me to reject those areas in my life and pray against those things in my heart. Genesis, it says, 9, verse 3 and 4, that they were made for us to eat. Again, if you're vegetarian, I get it. I'm sorry. It's just what it is. I think that's cruel that you can't sense that celery is crying out when you're eating it. <laughs> How hard is your heart that you can't hear the cry of a little plant? Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. All these things, again, we, again we, if all I'm doing, I don't need to look at what, how I need to change. I need to look at the one who I want to become like. When I become like him, he changes me. I don't renew my mind by reading my books. <laughs> I renew my mind by reading the word of God. And then I write some little books, but it's not the same thing. We have a more sure word of prophecy, the word of God. So the, the thing that will trend and is trending now is clone Christianity. Where we just kind of mimic other people. We are following them. Anyone who has a genuine heart for God would say, follow me as I follow Christ. Right. I stop following Christ, don't follow me. Right. And you'll have your own flavor of doing that. You know, I know Amy's a great worshiper, Vanessa's a great worshiper. I'm not looking to them to see how I should worship. Right. I may look at them in a moment and say, man, that's awesome, they're going to close my eyes, and I worship God myself. They inspire me to be me in worship as they are being them. Then another thing that's gonna trend is camouflage Christians, where we are culturally invisible. We just blend in. This is where the great falling away will take place, is that people who are going, you know what? You know, and this is what happened. We went to China and they had churches there that already had defined their new Bibles, whatever they were, to be conformed to the state. And that's what's happening. I wrote about that in 2009, that there'll be brands of Bibles. The Antichrist will talk about Jesus. I, the day I got saved, and the man approached me, he said, my friend, and said, I'm into Jesus. I said, I'm into Jesus. Great teacher, avatar, guru, you know, great teacher. No, just Jesus, Francis, just Jesus. And so we have to understand that the world is gonna mimic seemingly biblical truth, but it's gonna be a lie. It's gonna be a distortion of reality. And we can be camouflage people or double-minded, unstable in all of our ways, double-minded Christians where, you know, I'm one thing in church and another thing on Saturday night. And, you know, I understand, I understand being tempted. All of us are tempted in different points. I'm fighting for my spiritual life like you are. But that was the number one thing that Jesus chided the Pharisees is that they were hypocrites. And the, way, the cure for hypocrisy is repentance. And say, God, forgive me, take it out of my life. Confess it to somebody. Confess it to someone else and that will help you. And then there's the NPC Christians. <laughs> and in video games, I'm really not that familiar with it. They're non-players. They're just little entities there, uh, but they're not real. They're just little stick figure Christians. But we are God's masterpiece, created as anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he's planned for us. I want my unique identity to be representing Jesus Christ. That's why, candidly, even when I 
um, recognized my season of pastoring was over, I wasn't signing up to drool in the second row. I crowd surfed out to make a statement in the heavenlies that I'm going into my next. I'm still going to my next. While there's breath in me, I'll be going into my next. I'm excited about my next. God's saving the best wine for last in your life. You may be getting old, but don't be old fashioned. Don't be, don't be limiting yourself as to what God wants to do. I'm preparing myself for complete obscurity. but I'm preparing myself for the one that I am living for. So no one else may know me at that point, but he'll know me. Now in this next generation, and, and uh, Brian really has a grace in this, and we're gonna be talking about this, the alpha mantra. And uh, this is the next generation. Uh, it's 100%, it's gonna live in a 100% digital world. These are people, that are born between 2013 and 2025. And we can see the propensity for that, being locked into another world, and you have all the amenities, all the toys, and honestly, that's why dating's not happening, that's why people are not forming new relationships, because they're not used to having to face uncertainty. And so if I can make my life certain, create my little unreal world, and then if you say that my little unreal world is not real, you're a bigot. And we're gonna have laws against you. It's coming. And Christianity will be right at the forefront. Alpha, alpha mantra, which is the generation born between 2013 and 2025, if life is good, and this may be a bit of an overstatement, but it's trending. If life is good, and, and uh, who cares if it's real? <laughs> so what? So what? This is my life. I create my reality. I like my reality. Who are you to tell me my reality is not as good as your reality? That's going to trend. And again, I'm, I, even though some of us feel like, man, I, I can see it in my kids already or grandkids, whatever, you pray for them. I got saved on Mother's Day because of my mother's prayers. She hadn't seen me in nine months. I, months. I laughed at her when she prayed over her food. She couldn't out talk me, but she out prayed me. And I got saved on Mother's Day. I got delivered from demons on Mother's Day. You pray for your kids. Don't give up on your kids. You have spiritual authority over your children and grandchildren. Everyone's in play. I'm in play. We're all in play. I can blow up my life in 10 minutes. Susie's asked me not to. <laughs> when alphas are old enough and fully indoctrinated, there will be no limit to what they'll eliminate. I, again, I'm not gonna force feed anyone in that generation saying that's where they're headed. I'm saying there will be a trending in that that will become pervasive in our society. We are in the most significant metamorphosis that American church has seen in a half, church, a half century. AI churches, AI pastors, AI I don't know where it's all going. Again, what happened to Israel yesterday should let you know that anything could happen at this moment. Not anything beyond God's ability to govern and protect and care. No, it's all, it's all fine. I'm training my soul to not care what's happening here, but how to respond here. That's my stewardship, almost done. So one thing we did at The Rock in the years I was here, and again, because I came out of craziness, barely got saved, and always had a mind that was very aggressive, and my wife was a professional counselor for me, saved tens of thousands of dollars just marrying her. <laughs> but because I traveled for 18 years as an evangelist, went to churches, and saw things that were so inspiring, I wrote a book called Church Wounds. <laughs> and so when I began to pastor, again, I didn't want to be the guy driving the getaway car for people to be you know, religious fossils or whatever. And so when we had leadership groups, we had about 450 leaders that attended groups of about 12 over about 20 years that we would meet with them. We'd ask one question, just one question. 
and we'd spend a few months doing it. If there's one area in your life where the enemy could pick you off, what would that be? Let's cut to the chase. Let's get past all this stuff. And then I would share that as a young man, I saw porn in caves, carved in rocks. <laughs> and so it affected me as a young person. And even when I came to the Lord, even though I did alcohol, drugs, all kinds of stuff, those things, I did not have any kind of a real interest in them. But porn had an had a interest, and it bothered me. Even now, saying it, I hate saying it. But I'm, I have shored up that area in a very big way. It will kill me dead. It will destroy my future. It's my heroin. It's my fentanyl. I hate it. I reject it in Jesus' name. It's poison. And consequently, I've not seen porn in many, many decades. But it's there. So I'd share that. And then we'd go around the room. And then people would share. And, and by the grace of God, all those years, we did not have leaders that fell. As far as I could tell, that is my awareness of it. What is the area in your life where the enemy could pick you off? Invite someone in. Invite someone in, someone safe that you can talk to and say, hey, I got this issue. It's out of control. And these are the guys I'm working with now on various levels, various things that they're not, that they, you know, made them a little pet. And they are not a pet. I think of C.S. Lewis had a book called The Great Divorce, and uh, this beautiful lady who loved Jesus had a husband who was kind of reprobate. She went to heaven, he went to hell. He went, she went to visit him in hell, and when she saw him, he had this little, this little creature on a leash that he was walking around with. And as she began to talk to him and try and share with him and love on him, the creature got bigger and bigger and bigger until she realized that the leash was actually on him and the creature was controlling him. And that's what we are dealing with, with our issues. So let light shine in your darkness. I remember going to Vernal Falls in Yosemite. And I remember walking up there and seeing, now, on the, you can't really see it that well here, but on the left side, there's no fence. There's a fence there now. And on the fence there, it said this, smooth, slippery rocks, moving water, stay back from the water's edge. If you slip and go over the waterfall, you will die. <laughs> I remember I took, I took that picture. I went, oh my gosh. It's like, maybe, you know, you might get hurt a little bit. It could be difficult for you. You're dead. You will die. And I love the definitiveness. I love the fact that, mm, exactly. Stop it. You will die. This will kill you. You're fighting for your life. You may have heard me talk over the years about three different levels of conviction. Embarrassed. A lot of people live and die. I know I shouldn't. I know I should change. I know. God, I hate doing that. No, embarrassed changes nobody. People live and die embarrassed. Then there's fed up. Oh, I'm so fed up. Oh, boom, I wish I didn't. Still, they live and die fed up. Desperate is all that changes. Where you are committed to, to I, I, it's a live and die issue. We are dealing with life and death issues. Not just temporary, but eternal potentially. And so that's the way I look at what I'm facing. Final verse here. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to share one more thing. The battle is always the Lord's. The accuser of the brethren, brothers has been thrown down. Someone come to the keyboard, if you would, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him. They have conquered him. They have conquered him. Three ways for you to be a conqueror by the blood of the lamb. Receive what Jesus Christ did for you. Um, you know, we just had a course we just finished called The Secret to Loving Your Life. And one of the men in his 30s went to the rock as a teenager many years ago, but he wasn't saved yet. And he acknowledged in our group online, Zoom, that, you know, I almost didn't want to do the course because it looked like it's going to be for people who are really following Jesus, and I haven't been. But he prayed with us as the course ended had a wonderful time of him surrendering his life to the Lord. You need the blood of Jesus Christ to cover your sins, to forgive you. And in this room, there are some folks that are probably not ready to stand before God and that you're not ready to say, God, you are the Lord of my life. Today, you can do that. Today, you can say, you know what? I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. He died for me. No one else did. He rose from the dead that I can conquer my sins as well if I'll surrender my life to him and let him be the Lord of my life. And then it says, by the word of their testimony, that's where that confession comes. 
That's where we talk about that small group thing, where you're sharing, where could the enemy get me? Where you're inviting someone to pray for you, to cover your back in the deal. All of us need that in our lives. You need someone or ones, safe people in your life, not to pat you on the head, but to encourage you and challenge you to stand strong in the Lord. And then lastly, who love not their lives and even unto death, which is the desperate thing. Amen. We, that was actually planned throughout. The, we met on that yesterday and decided at that moment we wanted a crashing sound. I know the American church, you know, I remember as a young Christian hearing Brother Andrew, who used to smuggle, he's from European guy, smuggle Bibles into communist nations. And I remember him saying, I'm a young guy, I'm listening on an audio cassette. And he said, uh, you know, I only go to America when God tells me I have to. In America, the Christians are very comfortable. I only go to America when God tells me I have to. I didn't go, yeah, America. <laughs> I said, God, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. If I don't follow the Lord, I can't expect my kids to follow the Lord. I can't, if they can't see Jesus in me, I, I can't imagine anyone, you know, being d- distracted from following Jesus because I misrepresented him. And I know that's, that trends. And we did a survey with church wounds, thousands of people, and found out that was one of the big deals. A misrepresentation of Jesus. Stumbled people. It did for me. I became an atheist at 15. Misrepresentation of Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's not whatever that is. That's not Jesus. So what are you going to do? I'm going to encourage you, first of all, if you're not sure, if you died today, you would spend eternity with Jesus Christ the most intelligent thing for you to do is surrender your heart to him today. It's your call, your life. Hey, you make your own decision. But my appeal to you, surrender your life to Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, live a transparent, vulnerable life. Invite people in. If you've got an area of potential addiction or addiction, the area where the enemy, one of those giants is kind of ruling and reigning in some quadrant of your life, you need to destroy that thing by the power of Jesus Christ. Invite someone in to pray against that thing, to break its stronghold in your life. That's why you're alive. That's why you're still alive right now. You're not too young. You're not too old for that to happen. And then lastly, prepare for the next season, guys. It's real. It's Israel, you know, two nights ago, uh, I remember seeing an interview on TV. A girl goes, we were to go to the beach today. It was our 50th anniversary. You know, boom. Like, you didn't go to the beach. She was in a bunker. So, uh, Father, I pray for everyone in this room, Lord. Again, we are not ignorant of his devices, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I just want to invite you, if you, uh, and I'm just asking between you and God, I'm not even going to look, but I want you to make a decision I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ right now. Just lift your hand right now. I'm not going to look. You just lift your hand between you and God. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I've not been following him, but I want to follow him now. Others who are here, you have areas in your life that uh, you know are not right. Areas that you are in some way uh, partnering with some dimension of evil that you thought you had to but you want it out. You want it off your life. Just, just lift your hand and say, I want that out. Jesus, I want it out. No more fear, no more lust, no more anger, no more, no more discouragement, no more depression. I reject it in Jesus' name. I reject it in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would have others around them that they could share with and say, I need help, I need prayer. Safe people, healthy people. And we claim, Lord, that we will stand, we will finish well. We will finish well, Lord. We belong to you, and we want to finish to represent you well on this earth. I pray your blessing on this church, Lord. I thank you for Pastor Sean and Amy, Pastor Aaron and Amanda, all the other leaders here, the elders, the magnificent church family, incredible uh, leadership in this church that I just smile when I look at them. We thank you for this season, this next 25 years, all that you have in store pray a mighty blessing on them in every way in the name of the authority of Jesus Christ.
give them great wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand, amen. <laughs>